It is always an honor and a privilege to be able to introduce a speaker, but today it is my special honor to be able to introduce a friend. Uh, Dr. Walter Kimbrough, who hails from Atlanta, and know somebody's in here from ATL. Just wanted you to know you're at home, you're at home. Uh, certainly is a, a prolific and outstanding individual in his own right. And he uh, graduated as student body president, uh, was saluted, salutatorian, uh, and he went on to earn degrees from the University of Georgia, Miami University in Ohio, and his doctorate in higher education from Georgia State University. He uh, became the youngest president in October of 2004 at the age of 37. He became the 12th and the youngest president of Philander Smith College, and in 2012, he became the seventh president of Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana. He's been recognized for his research and writings on HBCUs and African American men in college, and has been noted for his active use of social media to engage students in articles by the Chronicle of Education, Case, Currents, and Arkansas Life. And therefore, he was cited in 2010 by bachelorsdegree.com as one of 25 college presidents you should follow on Twitter. Hence, his worldwide name, Hip Hop Prez. And I know you're following him now as he's uh, al always on board. In 1986, he was initiated into Zeta Pi chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity at the University of Georgia. He is the author of the book, Black Greek 101, The Culture, Customs, and Challenges of Black Fraternities and Sororities. And so I am so excited that he accepted our invitation to come today to bring us words of information and inspiration as we pause here at Alabama State University to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. King. Hornet Nation, Help me welcome the president of Dillard University as our keynote speaker, Dr. Walter M. Kimbrough. Come on, Hornet Nation, let's give him a welcome. Come on. Good morning. All right, y'all did pretty good. You know, I drove over last night from New Orleans and I'm driving back today, so I gotta make sure I got good energy as I keep going through the day. Good morning. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. To our, our president, President Boyd, uh, I'm excited to be here. She's still in that first year cycle where everything is new. This is the first time, so to be the person to deliver this King Address during that cycle is important, so thank you for having me here. Um, it, it's probably a little bit more of a daunting challenge most places because you guys have a president who is a prolific speaker in her own right. Um, someone that, I remember the first time I heard her, I called my mom. My mom is also a Delta and happy Founders Day to all the Deltas out there. Um, I called my mom, I was like, man, Gwen, boy, she's just off the chain. She's just wonderful. So someone that I've always looked up to in terms of her leadership, um, in a lot of different arenas, particularly in our fraternity and sorority world, and to have someone here at the helm of this, this institution I think is very important. So I want to thank her for having me, and thank you for being here. This institution is also important to my family, uh, my wife's side. Her mom uh, is a graduate of Alabama State, Sandra Matchett Nobles, and some of her siblings, there are alums here who might know some of them. Myra, who was in the chapter either right before or right after you, Myra. Uh, who married Ronnie, he was a student here, and then her brothers Johnson Matchett and William Matchett. Um, so there's a, a history with our family with Alabama State University. Um, with that being said, for a few moments today, i like to have a conversation around the subject, the selfie instinct. The selfie instinct. Every year around this time, I, I try to look for new things to read about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to get a different perspective and not just the same old perspective that we normally receive. Last night, I finished a new book by Tavis Smiley called Death of a King. And in the beginning of that book, and, and the book is fascinating because he focuses on the last year of Dr. King's life. 
April 4th, 1967, April 4th, 1968. And that's important to me because I was born in April of 1967. So that was the first year of my life, was the last year of Dr. King's life. And one of the things that Tavis Miley writes early on in his book is he says, the martyrdom has undermined his message. As a public figure who fearlessly challenged the status quo, he has been sanitized and oversimplified. He's no longer a threat, but merely an idealistic dreamer to be remembered for a handful of fanciful speeches. And based on really understanding that last year of his life and the kinds of things that Dr. King was addressing, we haven't really made much progress, but we get excited at this time of year. August of 1967, SCLC is meeting, and at that time, the SCLC was in disarray, and people were fighting, and everybody's fighting for power. So he gives this speech called, Where Do We Go From Here on August 11th, 1967? And this is what he says, August 11th, 1967. Dr. King says, of the good things in life, the Negro has approximately one half those of whites. Of the bad things of life, he has twice those of whites. Thus, half of all Negroes live in substandard housing, and Negroes have half the income of whites. When, when we view the negative experiences of life, the Negro has a double share. There are twice as many unemployed. The rate of infant mortality among Negroes is double that of whites, and there are twice as many Negroes dying in Vietnam as whites in proportion to their size in population. In other spheres, the figures are equally alarming. In elementary schools, Negroes lag one to three years behind whites, and their segregated schools receive substantially less money per student than the white schools. One twentieth as many Negroes as whites attend college. Of employed Negroes, 75% hold menial jobs. This is where we are. And you could add, this is where we are today. Today. So if progress has been minimal and these statistics are marginally better, why are we even here for a King Day commemoration, celebration, or memorial? Is this simply another annual exercise in what I like to call our Martin Luther King addiction, where we intoxicate ourselves with flowing rhetoric, inebriated with catchphrases like let freedom ring and we shall overcome. Is this our annual time to overdose on all things king and go back to living lives that are diametrically opposed to speeches other than I have a dream? And just to put this out there, that's a speech I struggle with. Uh, Mr. President Darren, I struggle with that, that speech. When I was in high school in Atlanta, anybody Benjamin Mays High School Academy of Math and Science? Any Mays High School? All right, don't, hey, look, don't hate Mays High School, okay? Um, we had Elks oratorical contest, and so I was in the contest, and I won at the school level, and I was at the citywide contest, and I talked about the state of athletes. It was, you know, today's black athletes, mega bucks, micro knowledge. I mean, we still dealing with those issues today. I thought I was doing something, you know, I'm in high school, and so I had a good speech, and I was delivering it, but I didn't win. I came in third, and the little dude who won with the little white suit that was too tight, all he had to do was talk about, I have a dream. He didn't say nothing, but people got caught up in the, I have a dream. And I'm still hating on that today. <laughs> today, I still got an issue with that. So what I'm saying is today we've got to really look at some of those deeper I issues that Dr. King identify and then figure out how do we move forward. During that last year of his life, two months to the date before he died, on February 4th, 1968, he preached about the drum major instinct. This is probably the most misunderstood of all of his speeches in my opinion because people start giving people drum major awards and that ain't what the speech is about. That is not what it's about. So. Today, I want to argue that before we go anywhere and we address those, those issues that Dr. King was de de deliberating about over that time, we've got to deal with this new dilemma. It's a modern electronic 
social media driven version of the drum major instinct and it might even be more powerful. So today I want to argue that we've got to learn how to deal with the selfie instinct. And there are three things real quickly. I'm a preacher's kid. There are three things United Methodist, so I got three points. We got to identify it, why it prevents us from addressing other issues, and then how do we replace it. So first of all, we move from drum major to selfie. Now, the drum major instinct, um, our good reverend over here, Cameron, and I'm taking him back to New Orleans with me. So I'm just, if he missing, y'all know where he is. He got to come with me because I just like his spirit. I can just feel it, okay? So Cameron, he based his sermon on Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. And of course, you biblical scholars understand that this is a passage of the Bible where James and John, Zebedee's sons, you know, come up to Jesus. And part of that, they're saying, you know, arrange it so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory. One of us on your right and the other on your left. We want to be up there with you, Jesus. We trying to be there. And so in that sermon, Dr. King says the following. We must understand that we have some of the same James and John qualities. And there is deep down within all of us an instinct. It's a kind of drum major instinct, a desire to be out front, a desire to lead the parade, a desire to be first. And it is something that runs the whole gamut of life. And so before we condemn them, let us see that we all have the drum major instinct. We all want to be important, to surpass others, to achieve distinction, to lead the parade. We've seen a little bit of that today. I'm watching the dancers, and they were just great. And people hollering out the names. I see you, Taylor. They're just hollering out the names. Where's Mr. Attorney General got fans? When did Attorney General get fans like that? They like, whoa, Attorney General. <laughs> we like that. It makes us feel good when we're out front and people recognize us and acknowledge us. That's a part of the instinct that we all have. T technology today then reinforces that. Apple leads the way, and they, re they reinforce it because they keep using the word, the letter I, iPod, iPad iTunes, iUniversity, iHome, everything is about I. I, they reinforce that. Then we have these other devices that we can make sure we have this broader presence so people can see us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Google+, Flickr, Tumblr, all of those things. Social media then gives us a chance to promote ourselves all the time and everywhere. So we take pictures. We take pictures of what we eating. Hey, now don't amen that one, Miss ASU. We don't, you can take it. I don't want to see what you eating, okay? We take pictures of where we are or where we've gone or where are we going. We like to take pictures of what we're wearing when we go out so people can see how we look. A lot of us like to tweet while we're watching TV so people know what we're watching on TV, which is kind of cool on Thursday nights when Scandal is on because I do that a lot. You know what I'm saying? Now, I missed Empire last week because people were tweeting about Empire, so I couldn't read the tweets until I catch it on demand tonight and then catch up real quick because I'm like, I'm missing something. I got to be involved in this. But the most popular of all of these pictures of things are pictures of ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the 2013 word of the year. Selfie, a photograph that one has taken of oneself, typically taken with a smartphone or webcam and uploaded to a social media website. It was made possible in 2010 with the creation of the forward-facing camera. 2014 was declared the year of the selfie according to Twitter's top trends last year. The term selfie was mentioned more than 92 million times on Twitter, a 500% increase from 2013, five times as many more times as the year before. So y'all know what a selfie is, right? Y'all know, right? 
Okay, I say I know they know. Okay, y'all know. I mean, and so let me just for those who still might not know, you, you got to know about selfies. It's like some basic things you got to know. Now, they're just basic. Sometimes you just got the basic cell phone selfie. Make sure you looking at yourself. Get that selfie like that. Some of y'all like to do the selfie in the car while you're driving, which scares me when y'all do that. Okay. You like to get the full body in the mirror selfie so you can check. You did that today, didn't you? <laughs> you did that today. You looking good. I, I can tell you. She did that today already. Full body in the mirror. And then you got sometimes a celebrity self. It's like, you know, if you're the president of the, the United States and you're at a funeral, you probably better not take a selfie because people going to talk about you if you do it. Or the... I don't know if you can be my minister if you're in the bathroom with a muscle shirt on and a hat on. <laughs> I'm from Atlanta. I just keep it real. You ain't. Don't do that, camera. Don't do that. <laughs> we got all the famous, I can't do it, the, the, the Kim Kardashian selfies. Okay? We just put it all out there. Even Anthony Weiner did the selfie, and y'all know which one that is. Okay? There's even a new term out that I saw last week called wealthy. It's a picture of us around lavish wealth, a private jet, or expensive bottles of champagne, a wealthy. So all of those things are out there. So the selfie is the 21st century iteration of the drum major instinct. We want to be seen, and we want to be famous. Well, point two is then we've gone from selfie to self-absorbed, selfish and self-centered. We use social media to show everything we have and then it creates a situation and anxiety where we start comparing what we have to what other people have. Dr. King in that speech says, it often causes us to live above our means. It's nothing but the drum major instinct. Do you ever see people buy cars they can't even begin to buy in terms of their income? You've seen people riding around in Cadillacs and Chryslers who don't earn enough to, to, to have a good T-model Ford. Maybe that's a Ford Escort today. But it feeds a repressed ego. You see people over and over again with the drum major instinct taking them over. They just live their lives trying to outdo the Joneses. The New York Times in December 2013 had an article called The Agony of Instagram. They say members of the Facebook generation are no strangers to the sensation of feeling a little left out when their friends post from that party that they weren't invited to. You scrolling your timeline like, what? They were, I ain't know about that. Thanks to built-in filters, everyone looks a little younger, a bit prettier, more cover worthy. But King's insights are even deeper. In fact, while many have called him a prophet for this speech, this one is extremely prophetic. He says the following, if it isn't harnessed, you will end up day in and day out trying to deal with your ego problem by boasting. Have you ever heard people that, you know, I'm sure you've met them, that really become sickening because they just sit up all the time talking or today tweeting about themselves. And they just boast and boast and boast and that's the person who has not harnessed the drum major instinct. What Dr. King did not know is that there would be tools that would be created so that we could measure our drum major instinct. People like to walk around and tout the numbers of followers that they have on Twitter and Instagram. And then when you reach certain milestones, you send out the little tweet, I got 1,000 followers. I got 2,000 followers. Then we have these tools that will tell us, like some all, they'll give you a weekly status report. How many people followed you this week? How many people unfollowed you? How many times this was retweeted? What was the mention reached? It was 39, 40,000 people that were, saw this tweet based on it being retweeted. And then there is this tool called clout. Clout is a measure of influence. When you go on a little site and you pull it up on your phone, it says, welcome, influencer. It makes you feel good. I go on that site and it's like, well, I'm an influencer. It makes you feel good. You get a score for your influence. This is something that we all 
deal with. I mean, it's something I deal with when I tell people I have four times as many Twitter followers as the president of LSU, and he's a much bigger institution. And more than anybody in the state of Louisiana, and more than any other United Methodist president, and more than any HBCU president with almost 10,800 Twitter followers, y'all follow me. See, you get caught up in this. We all get caught up in trying to deal with that instinct. But King knew this was a problem. He said, when you don't harness the drum major instinct, this uncontrolled aspect of it, it leads to snobbish exclusivism. He says, that's what happened. We do it within our fraternities and sororities. And he said, I'm a member of several. He said, we do it in our churches. Churches like to say, we got so many doctors. We got so many lawyers. We got so many educators. He said, you should have all those things, but that should be the one place where none of that stuff measures, matters. None of that matters in the church, but we get caught up in that, and that's what we move forward with. You know, that's one of the lessons I had to learn from my mom to try to deal with that. My mom taught religion and philosophy at Clark Atlanta University. And particularly at private HBCUs, you get students from all around the country who can't go home for um, the holidays, for Thanksgiving. They can't go home for Thanksgiving to go home for Christmas. So, I mean, even at our house, and we had like 25 students at the house uh, for Thanksgiving this year. I had a ham and two turkeys and still no leftovers. I'm still a little salty about that because they ate everything. So my mom would always invite people to the house, some of her students from Clark Atlanta. And one year she told me about a young lady who was coming to the house for Thanksgiving dinner. And my, once again, my mom teaches religion and philosophy. And she said, I'm going to invite this young lady to the house. This young lady, uh, she has a job. She's Nick Dezius, and she's going to come and have dinner with us. And I was telling my mom, I was like, ah, I don't know if you need to invite her to the house for, for Thanksgiving. Um, that's, I think that's a problem. She said, look, and she just started reading me the ride act. She was like, look, I understand she's Nick Deezy. She's got to do what she's got to do, you know, but she's coming to dinner with us. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all know what Nick Deezy is? Anybody know? Let me, let me help y'all. Uh, y'all familiar with the ballet? You familiar with the ballet? Yeah? Okay. We might call this, like, the urban ballet. So a ballerina wears, you know, tutus when they perform, and the urban ballerina, the Nick Deezy's, might perform fabric free. Okay? Okay? You get it? Y'all get it? I mean, the ballet, you know, Johann Bach, you know, Sebastian Bach, and the classics are played for the ballet, and, you know, it might be Lil Wayne, YG, Kevin Gates, you know what I'm saying? Migos. All right, so. I had that snobbish exclusivism. She not, she can't eat with us. She can't eat with us. And I had to have that checked. And all of us at some point in our life got to get that checked. But thinking that we're better than someone because I'm a student at Alabama State, I'm a graduate at Alabama State, and someone else, we got to get all that checked. And that was Dr. King is saying. That's a part of that drum major instinct. We start thinking that we're better than other people, and we've got to put that in check. So the final point then that we've got to, figure out is that we've got to move from these selfies to an idea that I like to call a survey, meaning how do we focus on service? King said in that sermon that Jesus didn't shun James and John. He said in, 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 in particular, Jesus said in substance, oh, I see you want to be first. You want to be great. You want to be important. You want to be significant. Well, you ought to be. If you're going to be my disciple, you must be. But he reordered priorities. And he said, yes, don't give up this instinct. It's a good instinct if you use it right. It's a good instinct if you don't distort it and pervert it. Don't give it up. Keep feeling the need for being important. Keep feeling the need for being first. But I want you to be first in love. I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. That is what I want you to do. King then says that the new definition of greatness is service. Ladies and gentlemen, basically, we need fewer selfies and more surveys. We need more stories about how we've given our lives and a commitment to somebody other than our immediate surroundings, our friends, and our family. Those people that we don't know, how do we show that? Our MC Brian was, was telling us, you know, about all the things that have happened. 2014 was a crazy year. 
it was, I mean, it was just absolutely a crazy year, the kinds of things that happened. Staten Island, uh, which, you know, somebody in my generation, you, you watching Staten Island and immediately you start thinking about do the right thing, Spike Lee, Radio Raheem. It's, I mean, that's exactly what that is. That, and, and that just really hit me at a different level based on my age. We have the situation in Ferguson. And so now we've seen over the last five and six months a lot of protests and lots of different things. We've seen it, you know, the pictures of the people with their hands up. Ben Crump spoke on my campus in December. Of course, he's working with those families. We've seen hands up. We've seen a hashtag hands up. We've seen T-shirts with hands up. Don't shoot. I can't breathe. We've seen all of this. And a lot of it's been driven by social media, which sometimes bothers me a little bit because some are even calling that slacktivism because there's this willingness to perform a relatively costless token display of support for a social cause with an accompanying lack of willingness to devote significant effort to enact meaningful change. So all this is good and people are active and they're engaged, but it makes me a little concerned, it makes me a little worried. Because I worry if we're gonna end up with these sincere shows of superficial symbolism instead of systematic strategies for structural solutions. Because we gotta get toward the systematic. So let me give you the example. We all remember the Trayvon Martin case several years ago. Just an odd and bizarre case. We heard the, the, the 911 people say, no, don't follow him, you don't need to be following him. He shoots this boy, another unarmed boy. Um, we marched because we wanted Zimmerman arrested. Even though it seems like Zimmerman finds a way to get, he just, dude just got arrested again. I mean, this is, you know, I'm just, I was thinking, I was telling my wife, it's like, I wonder what those jurors felt like because they, they humanized him. Oh, George, blah, blah, blah. They made him like the boy next door. And dude has been in trouble just consistently. So why did they buy into this narrative that this is some good dude when we know that's not true? It's not true, but they didn't want to arrest him. So we had our hoodies on and we marched and we had our iced tea and our Skittles and we wanted him arrested. He finally got arrested. And then we watched that trial and I'm watching the trial every day that summer. Um, and it just, it was just disheartening how everything played out. trial is over, he's free, and we forgot all about Florida. We hear about Zimmerman because he gets back in trouble. We ain't really thinking about Trayvon, his parents pop up every now and then, because we thought the work was done. Let me tell y'all, why, why we started chilling, the people who support the, the idea of staying your ground in Florida, they've been working. Let me tell y'all what they've been doing. The NRA and a gun rights group in Florida called Florida Carry are now trying to change the law in Florida so that the burden of proof for self-defense is not on the defendant, but on the prosecutor. They're moving it now so the prosecutor is going to have to prove self-defense. And we know that the prosecutor has a lot of leeway to decide what they're going to deal with. You know, the prosecutor like Bob McCullough in St. Louis that didn't do anything. You know, the prosecutor like Dan Donovan in Staten Island. We did all those shows, hoodies, marches, everything, and then we stopped, and they have been working. That's got to be the lesson that we understand. Yes, those marches and everything are important, but I think one of the major things we can learn from the civil rights movement is how people were organized and made things happen. We just can't march and then just say, we've done our job. We've got to really be engaged on a broader scale. So where do we go from here? Our goal has to be to help other people. We got to first get over ourselves, who we think we are, our status, our number of friends and followers and likes. We've got to help someone in need and quit acting like we don't see them. You have to do something. So the selfies then have to become surveys because this is what King preached about. And there's something that each and every last one of us can do. If you're an alumnus or a faculty or staff member, it could be as simple as trying to help a young person find money to stay in school or to get them back in school. How do we get more and more people to support? How do we get our alumni giving rate up so more people are supporting that? 
Students, how many students are working as a big brother or big sister? A lot of that is going on. We need more people mentoring, yet we aren't seeing a lot of people run to mentor people. That's something that you can do. All of us can just assist people in the day-to-day -day life. I, I was just heartbroken one day. These people standing on the corner in New Orleans with a sign saying, we just trying to raise some money so we can bury our grandmother. We 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 not we not as we just trying we don't have enough money just to bury her. How do we live our lives differently so we can impact people who are hurting and struggling in our society and not just think it's all about us? It's got to be about everybody else. And in fact, social media is starting to figure this out as well, because the word now is changing. It's not so much about selfies, but usies. I like that. It's about us. It's a group of us that are taking that picture together. It's about this relationship. It signifies that we're all in this together, not just me. Well, in that February, Dr. King concluded that sermon, and I want to conclude this afternoon with words from a song that my dad, as I say, is a minister. He says, when, when I have my funeral, this, is, this song has to be sung. And the song is, If I Can Help Somebody. Very powerful. And if you haven't heard it, you know, take some time and listen to it. But the words go something like this. And, and this is something I think we have to do if we're going to really deal with this selfie instinct to improve our communities. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody who's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. Thank you very much, Alabama State University.